Hey, how's it going? Depending on how strictly you classify Mew, we've done three of the five legendary generation one Pokemon and they've all been fantastic top tier runs that I'm pretty excited to revisit one day. And right up front, let's just say a couple of things. Let's lay out some things out on the table about Moltres. The first thing is that this little bird is also fire and flying typing just like Charizard. And you might look at the mostly superior stats and think that this one has some potential, but just take a step back big dog let's lower our expectations now i'm gonna hold off on the full list of problems that we'll face in today's video until we get into the footage but suffice it to say that this one has a better chance of being like scyther or executor rather than smashing through the game like polyrath or nidoking all i'm trying to say is that you should temper your expectations guys just because you are a legendary pokemon doesn't mean that you are guaranteed a top 10 spot on the tier list and it's just the message is that it's all right to be a little bit bad. Now Moltres has a really cool design. I really like it as a Pokemon. At least it has that going for it. Although my initial analysis of Moltres was that it's going to be not that great, I'm still going to do my best like always to see if we can get a respectable run out of it and maybe it'll just surprise us. But before I begin, I would like to quickly say that I do solo run content often and if that is something that sounds interesting to you, consider subscribing to be kept up to date. Now it's the likes and the comments that really help these small channels grow and if you could just spare a second, whether you are a returning subscriber like Not Gaming, someone new, maybe someone that never even thinks about that sort of thing, or maybe you just don't know what to say, I got you. Just scroll down and type in Fire Turkey, and that might help this video get recommended in the YouTube algorithm to more like-minded individuals. So with that out of the way, just sit back, relax, grab yourself a soda pop, and let's just get to it. Like always, I replaced Charmander with Moltres via the Universal Pokemon Randomizer, and for anyone wondering, this is the last of my backlog footage, so we'll be seeing some updates to the overlay next week. One of my favorite set of games is the Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Trilogy, and since Moltres is a Phoenix, and I don't really have high hopes for this run, I thought that Wrong, as in Phoenix Wrong, would be the perfect name for the run, and not convoluted and hard to understand at all, and it would at least give me a reason to use some of that beautiful soundtrack in the background. And while we are in this early game headed towards Brock, this would be a great time to quickly lay out all of the problems so that I don't have to keep repeating them throughout the run and we kind of get the full picture moving ahead. Now first, let's compare this to the other legendary birds. Now we've done Zapdos already and it gets the best flying move in the game early with Drill Peck and it gets access to Thunderbolt fairly early at Surge. Now we haven't done the Articuno run yet, but it does start off with Ice Beam right from the get go and it also gets access access to Bubble Beam from Misty. Now Moltres on the other hand, it gets the complete shaft in terms of movesets. It seriously, it gets one of the worst movesets in the entire game, considering the fact that it's actually a legendary and its stats are so high. It's almost like somebody at Game Freak just hated this little turkey. So since we don't learn another move naturally until level 51 and that move is only Leer, it means that we are pretty much stuck with Peck and Fire Spin for the vast majority of the run. Now Peck isn't terrible. It's like the tackle of flying moves, and as far as minor trainer battles goes, it's pretty good because we have a lot of bug catchers that we're going to see in the first part of the game. Now, I've talked about rap on some of my other runs, and it's pretty broken because if you have higher speed than your opponent, they're just never going to get to take their turn. Now, this does have the caveat, and that's the fact that rap will almost, it'll miss a lot of the times, especially when you need it to hit, because it has subpar accuracy at 85%, and you'll just miss enough to kind of offset that. Now, Fire Spin works exactly the same way with one key difference. Fire Spin has a very bad 70% accuracy. Now, you guys already know that I think moves like Mega Punch or Barrage just aren't that reliable with only the 85%, so it goes without saying that you will almost certainly miss a ton of Fire Spins throughout the run. The funny thing to me is that it doesn't even have a boost in the base power over Rap either. It just, it has the same 15 power, which means that a lot of times it's only 
only going to hit two times and be worse than Peck. But I could go on all day about this. It's just not that great of a move. 70% accuracy is pretty awful. Now just those things alone are almost enough to doom Moltres right from the start. But the fun has only just begun my friends. The biggest thing that sticks out to me, and this is kind of more of a knock on Generation 1 in general, is that Moltres does not learn Flamethrower. And the fact that there is no TM for Flamethrower despite there being one for Thunderbolt, Ice Beam, Surf, and all those similar moves just makes a lot of fire type runs a lot worse than they probably should be. Now the overall TM learn set that we have to work with is also very sparse. There's no coverage moves or pretty much any help at all. And the best option that we have for the entire game is Fire Blast, which we're not going to get until we beat Blaine. And that's really far off. It seems like a lifetime from now. Moltres is also fire and flying typing. It's just not a great combination. There's many weaknesses and the fact that fire doesn't resist ice means that Lorelei will also be a problem. And then the one little nice little cherry on top here is that we are in the slow leveling group and when you just kind of mush and combine all those things together, you can really start to paint a picture about the dire nature of this run. Now I'm sure there are some things I forgot. I probably went on a little bit too long, but it's okay. But but those things combined are really what made me hesitate to actually do this run and it's kind of what's going to make my job a real uphill battle today. Now this isn't my first Moltres run. I did a practice run or two to kind of best test how to handle these obstacles but if you really want to see how early these problems kick in look no further than the Light Years Junior Trainer. Now with Misty being that huge looming threat ahead and being in the slow leveling group it means that I need to tackle a lot of optional battles and generally, this one's not that bad. But with Moltres, this battle's not guaranteed. I originally wanted to save all the fire spin PP, and although Diglett is very frail on its own, it just does a ton of damage to me before I even make it to the Sandshrew. And from here, the Sandshrew Sand attacks me a copious amount of times, and I just can't get through it. And already this early in the game, we have a reset. Now to avoid further resets, I have to go back in and use fire spin so that I don't have the same fate. Now I get by but I am missing quite a bit of health so I have to use a potion and I'm not really feeling that great about the future already guys. I am missing one PP of fire spin but let's just take a look at Brock. Now the play here is just to spam fire spin. It's a special attack and if we get lucky we'll hit four or five turns and we won't miss a whole lot. Now overall it's not too bad on Geodude because it could go really great if it just uses defense curl and on this attempt I actually have a good run. I'm only missing a few health before moving on to the Onyx. Now not having a move to bypass bite isn't quite as bad as it sounds now there's a quirk to even if let's say my fire spin hit all five times during its mod it would only do damage for one of those turns back to me now the only potential downfall here is running out of power points of fire spin too early and i do run out but it's not that early it's late enough to where i can switch over to peck and this fight is actually possible now i think that this fight would be really tough if you did it immediately but the fact that we need the extra battles ahead Head, I didn't really struggle too bad here and we can just move on. Now as I said earlier Moltres can't learn anything helpful at all and outside of picking up some of the easier trainers the road to Cerulean isn't anything to note so let's pick back up at rival number two. Now the main goal for this fight as always is to try avoid sand attack. Even though fire spin has awful accuracy I'm able to lock down the Pidgeotto and get it into peck range and that means that I'm healthy and my accuracy isn't debuffed by sand. Abra's whatever it's literally a wasted team slot and can't even do anything to you and even though I've detailed a lot of those things that's going to hold Moltres back you can't forget that it still has a really high stat total and it can really breeze through a lot of these neutral early game matchups without much hassle. Now moving ahead there's not much to say about the next segment. There are several bug types so that means that things are going to go pretty quick and if you really want to see the effects of the slow leveling group compared to our last run we were only level 19 at the end of the route compared to Charizard already being level 24. This means that with a bad move pool and a low level we have no choice but to skip Misty and today we'll just make our way down to the SSN where I have to make the very sad walk past the body slam room. I pick up the rare candy and let's quickly get into rival number three. Now just like last time the idea here is to fire spin the Pidgeotto so 
we can avoid sand attacks and it works out pretty well once again. I do take a quick attack but fire spin crits meaning that I'll crit for every single turn and I go for a peck to finish it off. I do take another quick attack and I'm already kind of missing about half my health so I'm a little bit worried. It all turns out to not really matter. Now peck might be weak but with a really good attack and our speedy bird once again you can see that it's not all bad. Moltres is mainly going to struggle on bad matchups which we can immediately segue into after I mentioned that I did pick up rest because Moltres might as well use everything available to it. And as for Misty, Staryu is not that much of a problem. A few pecks is all it takes and with decent special, it's not too bad. We tank the water guns really well. Now as we've grown accustomed to, it's the bubble beams and the crits from Starmie that always cause the problems and it's no exception here. I lose my first attempt to a bubble beam crit and I also get crit by one on my second attempt and that's just two more really fast resets for our firebird and it's just trying to do its best guys. Finally on the third time I avoid any crits and I'm able to get a crit of my own to end this battle and honestly this wasn't that bad. I wish this was possible without having to go down to the SS and first but it's kind of it's expected and we just have to make the best out of the situation that we are in. Now moving ahead to Rock Tunnel you already know that the self-destruct hiker is going to be a huge pain. Apparently his name is Dylan. Uh, somebody said that in the comments to me but just look at how insane the damage is from this double super effective rock tomb. I do learn rest after Misty for this exact moment because the idea is that maybe I could soak up the damage from the rock throws or maybe a self destruct and hopefully be at full health with the graveler coming in and from there I can just tank a self destruct or maybe just win. In theory it's a really solid strategy but the game just never wants to cooperate. Either I tank a move, rest, get hit real hard for three turns while I'm asleep or maybe I'm still asleep when the graveler comes in and I just can't outlast the damage. Now overall here I rack up four additional resets all in very similar fashion and without rest I'm not sure how you'd make it past this fight. Even in the final attempt I get extremely low and it's just kind of luck from the AI move selection that I finally make it past this one. Now I would say that this is in the overall top three worst fights in the entire run and it feels like it's been a while since it's really been this bad. Even in the executor run I was able to use some candies, get access to stomp, and kind of easily cruise past this one. Now this it hasn't been great so far but let's just keep going. Going into Celadon the game will at least give us a little rest for the moment but it's important to note that we pick up the easily accessible PP ups for fire blasts in the future. Now it's time for the rocket hideout and I'll be picking up the usual high money items and let's take a quick look at Giovanni number two. Fire spin works very well in the onyx like we've seen with Brock but when I miss here just take a look at how bad that rock tomb hurts. Onyx has such low attack and it's actually ridiculous how much damage I took. The Rhyhorn has a moveset that rivals Moltres's and it's not a threat. Similar to the other rocks that we've already beaten, Firespin does its job fairly well. Now as for the Kangaskhan, I figured something like a Comet Punch 5 hit or a Comet Punch crit would take me out, but its special is not great and Firespin does the same job here just fine. And this is kind of where we're at with Moltres. I'm going in depth with Giovanni number one because even this isn't a guaranteed fight. From there I actually have to visit the Celadon Ma early due to skipping Surge earlier. I pick up the TMs by exchanging the beverages just because I need all the money that I can get. Now normally I don't do this because I think it takes a lot of time but the desperation is kind of kicking in and I take this time to also pick up four calciums a little early because I'm already here. I pick up Fly and I don't learn it immediately. It really says a lot about your run when Fly is one of the best moves that you're going to learn. It's got 70 base power and it doesn't have 100% accuracy and the reality of it is that since since it takes two turns, it's actually equal to just doing two pecs. And I bet you could argue that pecs actually better in terms of damage because it has two separate times to crit. The fact is that I actually need the invulnerable turn. For really tough matchups, being able to avoid some damage edges it out in the end for me. I also think that this is the first time that I'm seriously using fly on my actual solo run Pokemon, so at least we get to see something new. Now it's time for Surge. I have extra levels here and remember that flying is resisted by electric so we have to rely on fire spin here. This one actually turns out pretty well and I don't miss any and I just kind of roll this fight. The Raichu would have been a problem if it got off a couple of thunderbolts but I will never have to know because I just make it past and I'm just really glad this fight didn't cause me a lot of resets. With access to fly outside of battle I go to Erica's gym and this time the last doesn't get to wrap me like in the Charizard run and I make a point to get all the experience in here before moving on to Erica. And I don't need to dwell on this battle Peck would probably be good enough here, but to ensure I get the one shot, 
Sprite, I go for Fly, and this one is straightforward. I would like to say that Vile Plume's Yellow Sprite is S tier and one of the best sprites there is. And if you disagree, leave a comment so I can dislike it and scold you for being wrong. Afterwards, I go ahead and I pick up Swift. It's not a great move, but it ignores accuracy entirely. And even though it is weaker than Peck since it doesn't get stab, it has some uses coming up. And today we're gonna skip over the Bugimon Tower. It's easy, it's trivial. There's no reason to make the video any longer than it has to be. Instead, let's pick up down in Fuchsia where I grab the final HMs of the run and then I return to Celadon to spend the rest of our money. I pick up the TM for Reflect and in my practice runs, it was absolutely necessary to up our defensive bulk. And I also go ahead and stock up on the rest of the calciums that I can afford to help our special defense mainly. Now let's talk about Koga. I taught Swift for this fight and I saved and I taught Reflect. This fight was really tough in my practice runs and it took a lot of effort to get past and it was mainly because I was getting chipped down and poisoned and on the first attempt I get poisoned almost immediately on the first coughing. And on the muck we can see here this is where Swift comes into play. Since I don't have a great answer for Koga's physically defensive Pokemon, muck just loves to use minimize and I needed a way to make it not matter and Swift bypassing accuracy does just that. Swift isn't too useful pretty much out of any point outside of this one Pokemon in this one battle but it's a fairly unique strategy for me and I don't have to dive into this very often. To cap off my very first attempt and cut it short, the poison early just made it really tough. I just don't have the damage and I don't even get to see the wheezing so let's move on. Now on the second attempt I opt not to use reflect and I keep rest. That way I can just heal up my health and get rid of poison if I need it and I'm hoping it's the remedy to not keep having to reset here and I do end up getting poisoned towards the end of the muck. Like we've seen in the horsey run, rest is just a godsend for subpar Pokemon that don't have an answer for Koga. I'm able to keep soaking damage and I'm able to just keep healing it up. I do take a little more damage than I would like before going into the wheezing. Now I go for fly, I'm hoping that it just uses self-destruct and the battle's over. It misses toxic. I do the damage portion of fly and then it just uses self-destruct anyway but I barely survive at 10 HP and I'm able to avoid any further resets. In my first blind run and even in some practice runs this fight was among the worst in the entire game and I'm really glad to be able to get this one down with only one reset so we can try to keep this time competitive. Now are you guys ready for the moment that encapsulates the entire run in one interaction? Now since we've beaten Koga, I'm gonna fish for a surfer and try to rush fire blast to get the run back on track. Now let's enter this little polywag. I bought two ultra balls, I throw the first one. It breaks out and it does a bubble, one of the weakest moves in the entire game. Now notice that bubble does five damage and I have 10 health left because I didn't heal after Koga because I'm dumb. When I was playing this live, I was thinking to myself, is this game just setting me up to miss a second Ultra Ball on this Poliwag and for it to hit me with another five damage worth of bubble? And guys, that's exactly what happens. This is so perfect and everything kind of aligned to give me this absolutely perfect Moltres moment. And I wasn't even mad about it. I was kind of in disbelief for a little bit, but I thought it was hilarious and I knew this had to be the run that I used for the video. This level 10 Poliwag seen a legendary Pokemon and thought, nah, I'm just gonna knock you out and I hope you all appreciate it. Now from there, my weekly swim down to Cinnabar isn't quite as brisk, it's not as quite as serene as it usually is, but it's still nice. Now after the mansion, it's time for a little tombstoner, brother, and then we can take on Blank. Now's the time I teach Reflect since the biggest threats will be the physical damage like takedowns and stuff like that, so let's just dive in. I set up Reflect and I utilize Swift for the most part. I do swap over to Fly once I make it deeper into the fight and things are going pretty well after the Rapidash. I have a lot of help, I have Reflect up, and this one should be in the bag. The Arcanine does its best to make my life miserable. I just can't do enough damage. It keeps healing. I take a couple of takedowns and after I get leered earlier in the fight, it just does a ton of damage. I go all the way down to 8 HP before I'm finally able to take this one out and this one was much closer than I would have thought, but I guess it's probably because I'm 10 levels lower and it made it a little bit harder than it needed to be. Now the real prize here guys is Fire Blast. It may only have 85% accuracy and only 5 power points, but this beefy stabbed 120 base damage nuke finally gives us some really respectable damage for the rest of the run and it will make things a lot easier looking ahead. I also immediately use the 3 PP ups on it and that gives us 8 uses and let's see how this helps coming up. Next is Silphco and I do the usual rounds like getting the rare candy on the 10th floor and after that it's time to see how rival number 5 goes. Pidgeot is first, I set up Reflect since I have it and why not. 
I take a small amount of damage and I see what that fire blast can do and it's one of the most beautiful one shots I've ever seen. A tear came out of my eye. Now Growlithe is just Growlithe, there's no need to talk about it. Execute is next and I don't want to go for fly in case it sets up reflect. So here I go for fire blast and it misses and execute gets reflect up anyway. So that's cool and I just take it out in the following turn. Alakazam is next and surprisingly it can survive fly with a little bit of health but I tank the confusion really well before I take it out in return. Finally up is Blastoise and luckily it doesn't have Hydro Pump yet. The worst it can do is Water Gun and it's not going to do a ton to us considering we have pretty good special and after a few flies and a swift I take it out and I take the battle. Now you guys can definitely tell the difference with Fire Blast here and for a playthrough that's only 2 hours and 36 minutes in at this point, maybe there's a hope for a really solid run despite all the problems I laid out. Now let's skip over Giovanni number 2 and take a quick note that I did pick up Mimic for later and now we can head over to Sabrina. The first part of this fight is very easy. Nice physical damage for Kadabra and a timely crit on Mr. Mom get us through fast and I have Fire Blast to not even let Venomoth think about being annoying for a second. On the Alakazam, it's more annoying than anything. Now I go for Fly, but Reflect stops us from doing as much as we could and Sabrina just spams Recover a lot. Now for some reason I forget that I have Swift and Fire Blast does actually do respectable damage here and Sabrina just keeps keeps wanting to spam recover over and over through most of this fight and this one ends up being a lot longer and a lot tougher than it probably needed to be because I forgot swift but at the end of the day the result is a dub in the win column and we can just keep rolling. Now going into Giovanni I do learn Mimic and just like with essentially 99% of Pokemon it makes this fight not that bad even if you're ditto. Well no I take that back. Rhyhorn is whatever we've already done the run we've talked about it earlier but bad moves and a weak special means that I'm free just to set up reflect and let fire blast rip it does insane damage for being resisted and it barely survives and I can just finish it off on the next turn the trio is next the moves in Pokemon red and blue are much worse than in yellow for this fight but duck trio still has dig and that's the key to victory here so I mimic it unfortunately fly does not one shot it and I take a growl and that's pretty unfortunate and it's gonna slow us down just a little bit now from here I just do kind of a mix of dig and I do a couple of fire blasts for the rest of the fight and since the Nido royal family doesn't have thunder and Rhinon doesn't have rock slide like in yellow this one's a breeze after the Doug trio and we don't have to dwell on this one much longer now let's keep it rolling and cue up that rival music and just dive straight into rival number six our next challenge in the run Pidgeot is first reflect set up and mimicking agility would probably be the play here but I just don't want to risk anything so I turn one fire blast I get a crit and we can move on immediately Rhyhorn is next and I feel like I've talked about Rhyhorn more in this run than I did in its own solo run but I can just safely set up reflect once again I crit on my fire blast for a second consecutive time and I'm just hoping that I haven't used up all my luck in this run. Growlithe is next and here I want to mimic agility but I don't set up yet because I'm scared of an untimely level up and losing my badge boost so I just go ahead and I take out this little puppy and let's just look ahead. Now execute is next I go for fire blast and I miss and I get poisoned which is unfortunate and makes the fight harder but after I finally take it out I level up to 44 and that means if I want to set up, I have to do it on the Alakazam. I go for the slow setup here and I take some minor damage in return, but the key here is that Alakazam sets up Reflect, meaning that Fly will not one hit, so I take multiple extra turns of poison. I go for a Hail Mary Fire Blast that does great damage, but it's not enough. I finally take it out, but I'm at 38 health and I'm poisoned, going into a fight that's super effective against me. Things are looking decent here. Now Fire Blast isn't going to be quite a two shot I get the Blastoise really low one more burn proc would have won me the battle but the AI decides it's done messing around and a hydro pump ends my life and honestly it's not that bad of an attempt on the next attempt, I don't go for Fire Blast on the Execute. I go for Fly instead, since it's more reliable, and I'm able to avoid Poison, which already makes this attempt better. And immediately, my hopes are thwarted. This Alakazam says, hey, I'm just going to crit you with Psychic as I'm trying to set up, and it's another reset. We go back at it. I take another crit from Alakazam, but it's not a Psychic, so I do survive, but I only have 15 HP. Now, it doesn't go for Reflect this time, so Fly can one-shot it, and let's see if we can work some magic here. I go for Fly 
die for some chip damage. Blastoise just starts going for withdrawals. I swap to Fire Blast since two more should finish the fight. I hit for decent damage. It goes for withdrawal once again and this fight is all but over unless unless maybe something happens like I miss Fire Blast and maybe Blastoise goes for Hydro Pump and doesn't miss and you guys know exactly that's what the exact series of events that's going to happen. That's another reset. The next attempt I'm missing a little extra health going into the Alakazam but I do set up. Alakazam doesn't set up Reflect. I tank Psychic pretty well. I get a crit and I don't really think it mattered but I'm in as good of a position as I have been to up to this point. Blastoise comes in. I'm going straight Fire Blast. I connect with a Burn Proc. It goes for Withdrawal. I connect with a second Fire Blast and Blastoise misses the Hydro Pump. And at this point I play it really safe. I go for a Fly because I know that a Burn Proc will finish it off and me being in the air and vulnerable guarantees that we win rather than some other shenanigans happening. Now, guys, this one was really tough. Sure, I, I was under leveled. I could have used candies, but I needed every ounce of experience at lower levels that I could get because we're not out of the woods yet. Now, as it stands now, we have 12 resets, but on the bright side of things is that a lot of Pokemon would honestly kill to be right here in this position. And even though this run's not going to compete for a top five spot, it still has room to be a solid B or B plus tier Pokemon. On. So let's shrug off all the bad times from the past and gear up for the toughest battles yet. I used my rare candies after the fight in the background as I was talking, but this got me up to level 52. And guys, we got our first level up move at level 51. It's Leer and it's here to save the run, guys. But enough joking around. Let's go into Lorelei and remember, guys, fire does not resist ice in Gen 1. And let's see if we have as much trouble as Charizard did. First up is Dugong. We have great special and fire. Fire Blast should do work here, and I just crit immediately and I take it out. Let's move on. Cloyster is next. I crit once again, but I honestly don't know if it was needed, since Cloyster just doesn't have that high of special, but either way, let's keep rolling along. Subro is next. With Mimic on the moveset, it's time for Amnesia, and we can really boost our special through the roof. Subro does boost its defense a lot, and I make a slight mistake. I just keep going for Fly, and it does next to nothing for damage, and I just keep doing it over and over. I'm taking more and more chip damage before I finally swap over to Fire Blast. But guys, do notice that my special is at an insane 778 right now, and I'm feeling pretty decent about that. Jinx is next. Fire is super effective, and it's defensively frail, so I just got my choice of moves here. I go for Fly to preserve PP, and because it's more accurate, and it's another one-shot. Lapras is last, and it has a pretty decent special, and it's pretty bulky. Fire Blast just needs to hit to get us through this one, and it does and it's another one shot and honestly this one was pretty surprising because Charizard kind of struggled here a little bit and this is one of the only spots in the game that I can emphatically say that Moltres performed better at a much lower level. Now let's quickly scooch on past Bruno real quick. For safety from some potential whatever rock damage I guess I just mimic Harden from the Onyx for the badge boost and it gives me enough stats to easily just roll past the fight. I got super effective damage for the fighting types and fire Fire Blast has shown again and again that it's strong enough to melt the rock tops. This is just your classic Bruno fight and there's not a whole lot of in-depth commentary for this one. Next up is Agatha and we don't have a super effective answer this time so how bad could it be? At level 53 I cannot one hit the Gengar with fly but I do respectable damage. Gengar misses its hypnosis and it allows me to take it out and we can just move straight on to the Golbat. I go for fly here and it does about half health in terms of damage. I don't take much damage in return. I avoid any status conditions and I just fire blast it in the next turn. Now it's time for the Honer. I go for Fly and I do about 99.9% .9 of its life before Agatha makes an aggressive swap into the Arbok. Now here I'm just sticking with Fly so that I can avoid anything like a glare and I do but I end up taking an acid that lowers my defense but it shouldn't matter. I finish it off. I take out the low health Honer and from there it's time for the final Gengar. It's just waiting on me. It goes for a Nightshade and and then a toxic that badly poisons me but at this point in the fight two flies have already kind of sealed the deal and I'm able to actually one shot this battle and honestly Moltres is kind of cruising right now guys with our current time this one might not be quite as bad as I initially thought it would be uh, I guess barring that everything goes perfect for the rest of the run. Objection! 
Your Honor, there's a contradiction in that last statement. You see, everyone that plays Gen 1 and has ever played a fire type knows that they struggle in one specific spot, and that's Lance's Gyarados that's waiting just ahead of us as the final gatekeeper. And why don't we just get this over with and see how bad that this could possibly be. But first, after using the rest of my candies, I get to level 57, and I get to learn Agility at level 55. Now, it's not the best badge boosting move or the most useful one, but it's a badge boosting move nonetheless. And we know how bad Gyarados can be for runs that don't have an answer to it or are just kind of weak to it. And in this case, Moltres is both of those things. On the first attempt, I do see if a double fly could just take it out. But annoyingly, it's just a little bit off. And it's kind of making me think that maybe proteins would have been the correct vitamin to buy. But he does have enough help to where I'm not sure if that's true or not. I can tank one Hydro Pump very well. So you might think that this one's pretty hopeful to get through without a lot of issues. But just kind of hold off on that thought for a second. On the second attempt, it's a little lengthy, but the gist here is that I set up a single agility. It allows me to tank a Hydro Pump a little better than last time, and the idea was that with the 12.5% attack boost, it would be enough to do the two hit, but it's not. I'm just barely off, and from there, I try to go for a second agility. I tank a second Hydro Pump. I go all the way down to 36 HP. I get a Hydro Pump miss, and that allows me to take it out, and now we can go ahead and look at more problems. Obviously, I'm in Dragon Rage range less than 40 hp so if lance uses that it's over but he kind of misses his move and then wastes some turns and i set up my last agility i crit on fly and we can move forward now the second dragonair misses its opening hyper beam but the fly isn't quite enough to one shot and we see the predictable dragon rage that takes us out once again gyarados takes me out once again on the next turn i try to see if i could maybe set up two agilities and maybe fish for some luck but there's no dice this is another reset on the next attempt one agility and a fly crit takes me on but you can see the problem here the Gyarados itself isn't the only obstacle not doing enough damage and tanking multiple hydro pumps just means that the rest of the fight is never going to be consistent I go down to 5 HP and I try to mimic hyper beam here I'm eventually able to wrestle down both of the Dragonairs but we can quickly talk about yet another problem being at 5 HP obviously is not good but even if I was healthier I just don't have anything to hit the Aerodactyl for neutral damage and everything I have is just resisted. I make it further than you would think but a Hyper Potion does make this one impossible. Now I try once again and I fail and several attempts ago I should have realized that this is a pretty futile effort but I really wanted this one to work out and without more stats this one's just not going to be possible unless I'm willing to go for like 50 resets just to prove a point and even I'm not that stubborn. After I fail this attempt I black out and I just reach tried the Elite Four for some experience. I'm not that far off from some of the ranges that I need and I'm hoping that this doesn't take forever but let's kind of skip ahead a little bit and we'll take it back from there. I take several trips back and forth blacking out to the Elite Four and we are back about 22 minutes of in-game time at this point and let's see how it goes. I'm level 63 now. I go for agility. Gyarados misses Hydro Pump. Fly does enough to easily two-shot now. Now the problem here is that I get hit by a critical hit Hydro pump and I do survive which is kind of impressive but I'm essentially in the same exact position I was 20 minutes ago at 31 health. At this point I'm just I just desperately try to mimic a uh, hyper beam and I'm just too low but let's not get discouraged by the first attempt back. On the very next attempt I essentially get the perfect Gyarados start and it's a turn one agility into a missed hydro pump that lets us get off a fly for some heavy damage but Gyarados misses a second time. Now from there I use a fire blast to quickly finish it off and I'm at full health for the first time during this Lance run. On the first Dragonair I need to take advantage of this fortunate luck. I set up my two agilities, I take Hyper Beam and from there I just hope there's no crits or anything funky going on. I do take some damage but considering what I just accomplished this puts me in a great position for the rest of the fight. I can easily one shot the second Dragonair with Hyper Beam and let's take a look at that Aerodactyl problem. This time I'm infinitely more healthy than last time and I'm just gonna go straight fire blast since it's special isn't great and everything else is resisted anyway I miss I tank a beam to the face but the badge boost and extra levels means I'm still a little bit above 50 HP and on the next turn I'm a little surprised that fire blast can actually one-shot aerodactyl 
120 base damage with stab. It's just not a joke, guys. And finally, the Dragonite, it's kind of anticlimactic, isn't it usually? I go for fly, I chip it down kind of low, it goes for agility, and I finish off the battle in style with a hyper beam, and I finally take this fight. Gyarados, guys. There's not much more analysis I can really say. It's just very, 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 very oppressive for fire types. Finally, let's get into the champion fight, and I'm definitely on my knees praying that this one isn't as bad as the last fight. Now, the lead, as always, is Pidgeot. Now, the AI here just kind of spazzes out. It mirror moves my agility, and I just get to fully set up, and I just fire blast it down. I'm still at full health. I don't know what he was really doing. Alakazam is next, and here I use Mimic on Psychic. I need the extra damage type that isn't resisted later, but Recover might have been the smarter play, but sometimes, guys, you just have to take a risk. Sometimes you just feel it in your heart. Anyways, if you want to know the raw power that a stabbed Fire Blast has, look no further than it actually one-shotting the Alakazam without a crit. That's actually really impressive to me. Right on his next, I go for Fire Blast. I can only deduce that this was a misclick while I'm watching the footage back, but it still does a lot of damage. And Ride On is Ride On, so we can just move on to the thickest little puppy in all of Kanto. Psychic does extreme damage, but it's just a little bit off, and it's unlucky that Arcanine actually misses its leer to give us a little extra badge boost, and I take it out the next turn. Executor's next, and I condemn this demon from whence it came with a Fire Blast. Now now for the finale, Hydro Pump is in the champion's deck, but Psychic is here to do heavy damage. It's actually enough to trigger a full restore, and then the AI just kind of takes it easy on me by spamming withdrawal, and I just kind of win, and that's it. Moltres has done it. It was anticlimactic, but it always kind of is once Gyarados is your biggest problem in the run, and as they say, it is what it is. Compared to Charizard, this one is pretty bad, but if it wasn't for old Gary, I think we would actually have a respectable run. But let's just take a look at the stats. As it stands now, Moltres finishes with a level of 64, 18 resets, and most importantly, a time of 3 hours, 45 minutes, and 59 seconds. We'll talk more about the tier list and whatnot in a second but first guys it's time for some bonus footage everyone's favorite even though only about two of you comment on it so anyway against the almighty one himself the genetic freak i decide to go straight fly and just like the end of the champion fight i kind of just win i take some swifts back it does pretty good damage but me too waste the turn on barrier at the end and it's just kind of too little too late and it just kind of gives me the victory and i don't even have to reset any additional times now remember guys you really need to let me know if you enjoy seeing Mewtwo because for me personally all it is is just extra work and I will cut it out if no one enjoys it. So time for some final thoughts here on Moltres and it's just that everything we talked about early in the video just kind of adds up and it just stacks the deck against us as we expected. Now for all the obstacles it had against it I think 3 hours and 45 minutes is pretty respectable. Now I'll pull up the older executor tier list here just to give you an idea it would be after my really old old Snorlax run that I need to redo, but before the worst runs I've ever done for evolved Pokemon like Parasect, Executor, and Scyther. Now, it's not a great showing for a Legendary at all, but if you didn't see that coming, I just don't know what to tell you. Now, just like I said in the Charizard video, the tier list is currently under construction at the moment. I really want to spruce up things visually, and it's taken a lot longer than I would like since I only work on the channel a few days a week, and I hope you guys understand, and if you don't, get over yourself, dude. If Moltres learned Flamethrower during level up or started with drill peck it might have been a really dominant pokemon but as it stands it's just really hard to get past all the bad things that motres has going for it but i think at the end of the day that's all i have for you guys i'm doing a lot of projects now and i'm not sure about the order that some of them are going to come out so i'm not going to say this or that is coming next because i really don't know but i will say that if you made it this far i love you i hope you have a wonderful rest of your week you're a real one and i'll catch you guys on the next video bye i